Lord, we thank you for loving us, for dying to set us free. We thank you that you are indeed good and your mercy endureth forever. We thank you that you overcame these incredible temptations as, as recorded historically, but as working out practically in our daily lives. Bring blessing to our study this day, for we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. 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 Good morning all. Welcome with us. We're good together morning. again, just praising the Lord. Something good is going to happen. Something good is in store. We're together again, just praising the Lord. Amen. Yes. Yeah, good morning. One also, the last, so what we left off yesterday uh, with uh, the uh, temptations of the Lord in the wilderness. Um, we were talking about that being uh, his baptism of fire. Uh, and I think, I, I just feel like, I don't know, maybe it's just me, but uh, I'm wondering how many people think in terms of the baptism of fire uh, in its complete sense, in the complete, which by that I mean, how many think of the baptism of fire as the, uh, the inspiration of the Holy Spirit um, literally firing us up to become more um, bold in our presentations, uh, more animated in, in uh, doing the will of the Lord, uh, just becoming more active in um, participating in the spreading of the good news. Uh, that certainly uh, the, um, the thrust of the, let's call that the upside of the baptism, but the other side, uh, I think, I, I think I need to spend just a little more attention on it. Um, this whole, the, uh, look back on the temptations in the wilderness. Uh, these, this uh, kind of showcases the challenges in life to, um, to uh, living a godly walk. In other words, that, that these were each uh, baptisms of fire, these challenges that Jesus faced uh, during his fasting period. And uh, to correlate those, I wanted to finish the correlation, I think we, we just mentioned that they're correlated uh, with uh, the, um, the categories of the uh, that are mentioned in 1 John 2.16. Let me, let's read uh, it then. Yeah, go to John 2.16, let's see. I got it. Go ahead, read it. Oh, you got it there? Yep. Yeah, verse, okay. Uh, I have to move your picture out of the way. And you can scroll down just two lines. The other way. Yeah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so in John, uh, 1 John, this is 1 John 2.16. But the world offers only craving for physical pleasure, craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. This is the world, this is the uh, craving of, of the uh, flesh, the cravings of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life as put in other uh, versions of the Bible. Okay, okay so... Me... Go ahead. Okay, so here we are uh, looking at Jesus' temptations, and how do they actually uh, correlate? Well, let's finish. They're not... Let's read 17. Sorry? I mean, let's read the rest let's... of the paragraph. Okay. For the world offers uh, only see. a craving of physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but these are from right. the world. And the world is fading away along with everything that people crave, but everyone who does what pleases God will last forever. There we go. And that's going to that's gonna bridge into chapter 5 of the Beatitudes, as we'll see. Um, but first of all, so the uh, just to get the correlation... <laughs> Correlations actually made here. Uh, the turning of stone stones into bread, right? This is one of the temptations Jesus felt, faced in the wilderness. Uh, correlates with uh, the des uh, desires of the flesh, right? The physical need 
and sensuality. Now, you know, you'd expect somebody to be hungry, and there's nothing wrong with that, having an appetite. <laughs> it's not the appetite. It's the, uh, the overindulgence in seeking every appetite as a source of pleasure. That's what ties you to the world. That's where sin uh, can take root. So that's one. Uh, throwing himself from the temple. This is another temptation that, the, that uh, Satan offered. Jesus reflects the pride of life in that uh, it would be a matter of uh, showing uh, a self-glory that uh, you're a favored person. God favors you. Watch me jump off this temple and, um, and uh, I, will, I will not uh, be harmed because I have, a, I have a special relationship with God. Well, Jesus did have a special relationship with God. But for us to do something like that would be putting God to the test. I mean, we would be uh, testing the Lord, which Scripture specifically says, don't do it. Let's, do not let's test add the, the word, Lord, do not tempt. Let's add the word foolish test. It would be a foolish test that we're putting yes. God to. Um, yes. We, we test right. God properly. Uh, God, is this your stuff for me? Um, we test it. So, sorry. Right. Don't put God to a foolish test. Yeah, exactly. Writing a, a, a million dollar donation check saying, God will provide the money. Don't worry about it. Yeah, the bank, you know, it'll uh, bankrupt my account, but... Uh, and it's like you're trying to make a good gesture, but still, you know, you're being presumptuous on, on the Lord, and he's, he's sovereign, not us. That's the deal. Finally, the, uh, receiving the kingdoms of the world um, reflects the desire of the eyes, covering, uh, coveting material power and wealth. Uh, and, you, you know, when you take it, when you realize, too, that this also fits into the pride of life um, temptation. Right. Uh, the whole idea of gaining worldly power uh, could certainly fit there as well. But in this, uh, in this particular exercise, um, the kingdoms, desire, desiring the kings of, kingdoms of the world uh, uh, reflects desire of the eyes. And what it is is getting your eyes in other words, Satan asks that if you do this, if you worship me, then I will give you these. I will give you the, these kingdoms of the world. And taking your, in other words, and substituting him for the worship that God deserves for the sake of gaining worldly power, that's obviously a, a step in the wrong direction. So there's the, uh, there's the actual correlation um, in, in this rendition. Obviously, you may have heard differently, and we'd love to hear uh, how you see the correlation going on here. Amen. There is another correlation that could be made with uh, Ephesians as well. Uh, in Ephesians 2, 20, uh, 2, verses 2 and 3, um, Let's see, let me read that. Uh, I've got that here. In which uh, you once walked, following the courses of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived uh, in the passions of the flesh, carrying out desires of the body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Okay, so we have uh, following the devil, passions of the flesh, um, and uh, let's see, tearing out the, the desires of the mind. Uh, very, uh, two of the three are similar to the uh, temptations that Jesus felt, uh, faced in the wilderness, and the third one, the power of the air, uh, is a little different. Uh, so the course of this world, following the course of this world, refers to the values, customs, and desires of the worldly system that oppose God, okay? Uh, as it says, uh, the Lord says, come out of her, my children, and uh, be not tarnished by the uh, ways of the world. Um, the uh, kind of correlation with the uh, passions of our flesh refers to sinful desires, temptations, and cravings, 
of the body and mind. We just talked about this with regard to the temptation that speaks to desires, which of course was magnified by the fast that Jesus was on. Finally, the power of the air is slightly different from the temptations in the wilderness. Following the prince of the power of the air, it's different yet it's not because Satan asked Jesus to worship him. So there is correlation there. But anyway, this refers to Satan and his influence over the world, leading people to disobedience. And the power of the air, of course, that takes on a whole new meaning in the current age where we have so much information flowing through the airwaves and over cables, of course, etc. But the power of the air is very, very powerful today when you think how much influence the media has had, for instance, on the presidential election. It's just astounding that a woman who couldn't gain a single vote in her own party's primary is now the presidential candidate of that party. Also in the power of the air, the whole even better example. Right, but the point is that she could then take that position and because of the media's backing of her, actually draw the whole, draw a major, a huge portion of the U.S. population. We'll see just how much in the near future, but millions upon millions of people drawn to support her simply by what the media is telling them. But where are her credentials? You know, there's no credentials there. And on the other side, America got to know Donald Trump not because of his casinos, but because of his television appearances on Shark or something else. Like, oh, a television star. So the media has taken us into both Dems and Republicans and made something famous that would otherwise be, you know, just rich people. Both, all four candidates are incredibly wealthy. I mean, the presidents and the vice presidents on both sides, incredibly wealthy and radically different than the guy at the grocery store or the guy at your gas station or whatever. Their worldview is radically different because of their wealth. And so how does this happen? Well, they get pushed to the front of the camera. I mean, if it was Abraham Lincoln's day, he was reputed to not being very, very fine looking. If you were just voting that election on appearance, but it wasn't. It was about how the conversations went, how the great debates went. So the media forces us into elevating very certain people into higher positions. And you think, whoa, that's really the work of the airwaves rather than, I mean, in old times, the presidents would make train trip or the campaigns was train trips. And you wave at the people and make a little speech and you get back on the train and go down to the next wherever. So life has changed. And we have to be incredibly careful of the airwaves because they define us. Are you beautiful? Well, then buy this skin toner or this hair stuff or whatever. Oh, that was last month's hair stuff or toner or whatever. You can't be beautiful unless you got all of this stuff. So our whole worldwide, by the way, because our ministry reaches out into different countries, people are driven by their appearance publicly or their appearance over the airwaves. And you think that is an incredibly bad position to be in because you can't, your outer beauty has minimal effect on who you are. So yes, we're going to spend thousands of dollars on cosmetics or whatever to make the visual impression. And I've told you this story before. We had a young woman living with us and she was fabulous and really pretty. 
and her mom said, you're going to get a nose job. Oh, I was outraged that the mom would think that this daughter, this real pretty daughter of hers, needed face work to increase her value. Uh, and after the surgery, still real pretty, but not nearly as pretty as she was before. So the Prince of the Air is forcing, is exposing all of these visual things to us, and auditory also, that, that help us, that cause us to have to adjust to the world. Now either you become worldly, politically, uh, uh, expression, I mean, physically, or you resist because the world, if you love the world, you cannot love God. And so because, uh, and back to Ephesians 2, 4, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It has been graced by you that you have been saved. And God raised up Christ and seated to us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ. So how amazing it is that what can be used for evil, including the airwaves, can be used for incredible good in, in sharing the word of God. Never, never in history has the word of God been, <coughs> been more accessible to the, to the populations of the world because of. So, so don't be conformed to the world. Don't think like the world thinks and don't view the people around you as for worldly. But understand, <coughs> understand that God cares for the individuals and does not want us to be conformed to the world. And the other thing that happens today is because in Christ's day, everything was public. I mean, everybody knew if you were in an adulterous relationship. The whole village knew. And now you can do stuff in secret. You, in your home computer, you can do any kind of evil. Now, I'm not advising that. On the home computer, you can lose your house gambling. On the home computer, you can destroy the morality of your family. So... <coughs> You have to make decisions that you're going to use what God gives for good and not be overcome by evil. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the thing that we're trying to get to, though, is that uh, the, uh, the whole idea of, of working through these headwinds, these uh, obstacles, these um, problems that we have. <laughs> if you don't have a problem to work, work through, uh, where's the victory? That's right. <laughs> the victory comes from working through these with the grace of God, the help of the Lord. Uh, mm -hmm. the, uh, let me just read a conclusion that uh, I've got here to the um, correlations we've been talking about. Yes. Jesus' responses to the temptations, his responses to the temptations show his victory over the influences of the world, the flesh, and the devil. Amen. And, okay. This serves as an example for believers to resist these temptations by relying on God's word and faithfulness. Amen. Choosing spiritual priorities over worldly and sinful desires. Amen. It also affirms Jesus' role as the one who overcomes these forces on behalf of humanity. That's right. Making him a fitting savior and understands human, that understands human struggles and temptations. Amen. Amen. Lord, we thank you. We thank you that you experienced life as a human. We thank you that you never sinned. We thank you that, that you encountered all of these situations and never sinned. And I thank you that you give us the grace to make our choices with our free will, that we can overcome by your power, mercy, and grace, the sins of the sins of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, by your grace. We thank you, O oh Lord, for the mercy that happens as we sing godly songs. 
as we watch godly stuff, as we think godly thoughts, as we fellowship together in, in godly grace, as we we talk about the scriptures. So the 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 basics of who we are is defined by the parts of our soul that we feed. If you feed the flesh, it will thrive. If you feed the spiritual life, it will thrive. Lord, help us to make good choices with our free will, to choose your way. In Christ's name, amen. 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 Yes, thank you, Lord. Thank you for this instruction, this uh, very important matter of the baptismal fire yes. and all of the aspects that we have to deal with of, that are uh, that are part of that baptism and uh, for the blessings that it, that it provides to be energized and fired up to live right properly and forthright for you but to have also that that inner strength <clears throat> that only you can provide to help us through the trials and tribulations and everything that we face in hardship uh, that um, that coming through those situations victoriously uh, are even greater blessings that uh, we uh, look to you for for that uh, for that uh, ability uh, that uh, that uh, capacity that divine um, uh, uh, conquest of uh, the the uh, trials of this life that uh, could otherwise overtake us. And we pray for your continued leading for that very reason, that we might get through these matters, uh, that uh, you may be glorified in all that we do. We pray this in Yeshua's name. Amen, amen. Blessings amen. to you all. If you like it, share it. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.